welcome to Protea Valley Church at home. I'm Brent, I'm one of the crew that helps lead this congregation of God's people. And it's really great that you've joined us at home watching online. Of course, we understand that you can't watch church. In fact, you can't even do church or go to church. We really believe you are to be the church. And so if at all possible, we'd love you to come join us at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. here in this building where this church meets uh, the church then gathers to sing God's praises, to listen to the scriptures read and preached, and then to go out and to be on mission together for Jesus' fame. So please uh, do connect with us, uh, connect with us either on our social media platforms or on our website, uh, proteavalleychurch.org. Uh, this is a snippet out of last Sunday. It's the teaching and preaching component of the service. We really hope that it's of service to you, that it would edify you that it would bless you, that it would equip you to go and be a Jesus follower this week. So let me pray and then let's get to the teaching. Father, Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the beauty of your word. Thank you that we can hear it read and preached to us. I pray that our hearts would be open to hear what it is you would say and that your word would transform us and change us so that we would look more like you day after day after day, Jesus. So come Holy Spirit, sharpen our hearing, and then sharpen our lives so that we might be an influence in the world for Jesus' sake. And so we ask this in his beautiful name. Amen. Let's listen to last Sunday's teaching. Good morning, everyone. If you're a visitor this morning, my name is Grant. I'm on team here. And just a wonderful opportunity to share this part of the service with you. Uh, we have kind of reached out to each other already, but we're going to do it again because I kind of feel like we need to just connect a little bit. So we, we can see this morning we really want to exalt Jesus. And so uh, you may be far from God or really close to God. It doesn't matter. When you think of Jesus, what is the dominant character trait about him that you think of? So you might not even be a Christian here this morning, but you have some thoughts about Jesus. And so if you're sitting near to someone or next to someone, just tell them what is the dominant character trait of Jesus that pops into your head. When you think of Jesus, you think of, talk to the person next to you. Tell them. One thing about Jesus. Okay, not difficult, not a difficult one. Walk up to anyone in the street and they'll have some kind of answer for that. So I've entitled the message this morning on my notes anyway, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And so that's what we want to talk about. We kind of do that every Sunday, I suppose. We do, at Prairie Valley Church, you're going to get Jesus every Sunday. Uh, but this morning, it really is all about Jesus. And so the topic that we're talking about and the scripture that we've chosen is one that I feel completely inadequate for, to be honest. The text we're going to read in Colossians is entitled in my Bible anyway, The Supremacy of Christ. The Supremacy of Christ. I mean, how on earth do I do justice to that kind of a label in Scripture, that kind of title, The Supremacy of Jesus? And so I've chickened out a little bit this morning, and I've, I'm going to tag in two other people to also share. So you're only going to get a little bit of me, but you're going to also get a little bit of Paul, and you're going to get a little bit of Sean. And together, I think like, you know, when you talk about something uh, being a diamond, you have to look at it from different facets to get the beauty of it. And so my sense this morning is when we talk about Jesus, that if you're going to just hear me, you're going to just get one perspective. And so the two guys are going to be tagged in a little bit later, and they're going to give you something of their perception of this text and something of the supremacy of Jesus and how it plays itself out in our lives. But before we do that, a little bit of a background to this particular text that we've got in Colossians. So it's written by Paul, probably while he was in prison, uh, to this little church made up of Gentile believers, predominantly, we understand. Um, we don't get a sense that he knows this church personally. In other words, it's not one of the churches that he planted. Someone else planted the church. Uh, but obviously through their pastor, he gets a sense that they need an, a letter that speaks into their context and into their situation. Apparently the, the, the city or town of Colossae was, uh, had been a, a booming town at some stage with a lot of traffic through it, but it had slowly began to die and got smaller and smaller. And so it was a struggling, it was a struggling town. Paul writes to a struggling church in a struggling town. And there seems to be two things that these Gentile believers are battling with particularly, which he tries to address. The first is they're battling with their pagan past. So 
they had found Christ, or more accurately, Christ had found them, uh, but they were still living out their Christian faith with a little bit of baggage of their old lives. So their old pagan lives are still flavoring their worship. Paul tries to deal with that. The second thing that he tries to deal with is that there's some false doctrines that are clearly evident in the life of this congregation. There's some stuff uh, that they're not quite getting right. We're not, he doesn't name them particularly, but the way he writes, it's clear that they're struggling with a bit of legalism. Uh, when you think of legalism, it's like lots of rules. Like they had a lot of rules. Like if you want to be a Christian, you've got to follow these five steps. You've got to do these five things. So he's trying to address the legalism in the congregation. Uh, but he's also trying to deal with the fact that they're quite heady. So they have a lot of head knowledge and they put a, quite a lot of weight on, on, on knowledge, on knowing, on understanding stuff. So they're quite an intellectual heady bunch. And he tries to deal with that because that's a, there's a, that's a falseness that can creep into so many congregations. And the way he spearheads his argument is this little bit of scripture that we're going to read this morning. And I'm going to ask Brendan to come forward and read it for us. Paul is kind of saying, if you put Jesus in his rightful place, everything else comes right. You put Jesus in his rightful place, and everything else comes right. Thanks, Brendan. Colossians 1, 15 to 23 and 27. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and you do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the beautiful word of God. Let's pray briefly together. Jesus, you are the living word. And we acknowledge you in this building this morning. Would you shape our hearts and shape our lives and shape our thinking in your name. Amen. So artificial intelligence, AI, has kind of taken our world by storm. It's, it's probably been the thing that dominates technology in a lot of conversations at the moment. To be honest, I'm not a tech guy, and so it's pretty much passed me by, but I thought I would get in on the act this week, and I went to this thing called Chat GPT and, um, and asked it a question, what is the best line of poetry ever written? Uh, I'm not a poet guy, but I thought uh, this passage of scripture is actually a poem, so let me get a handle on it, and so this was the answer. As an AI language model, I don't have a personal opinion. But I can share with you a line of poetry that is often regarded as one of the best and most famous in English literature. It comes from William Shakespeare's play, Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. So apparently that is the best, most popular line of poetry ever written. I just want to say to the teenage boys here, I wouldn't use this as a pickup line in a pub uh, down in Durbanville at any stage, but there we go. It is poetry. 
And the thing about poetry is it gives language and um, it kind of puts flesh on bones. For me, poetry gives us an ability to um, take hold of something that is ordinary and, and yet gives it a beauty uh, and a splendor and a kind of des a description that our hearts are able to resonate with. That's what poetry does. It kind of opens something up in a way that, that just engages our hearts probably more than more than our heads. And so I think it's not an accident that Paul decides to talk about Jesus in a poem. This passage that we read here, the first part of it anyway, is, is a poem. It's written as a poem because what he's trying to do, he's trying to describe this Jesus who is so magnificent, who's so supreme, that actually you've got to sing a song about him or you've got to, you've got to write a poem about him because there's no other way. And if you take time to read this through and work it through, you'll, you'll just see the beauty of it. And in fact, there is a translation that some people don't call the Bible. It's called the message. So a guy called Eugene Peterson, he, he took scripture and he, he tried to translate it in a way that is far more, uh, far more figurative, uh, giving perhaps more honest reflection to the original language. And so it's more poetic, it's more flowery uh, rather than being accurate. And so his um, translation of this particular text is just breathtaking. It is just beautiful. And so... Uh, Colin couldn't be here this morning, so I asked him to read it for us and record it, and so we're going to play uh, this passage from the Message Version. Listen carefully. We look at the sun and see the God who cannot be seen. We look at the sun and see God's original purpose in everything created, for everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, Rank after rank after rank of angels. Everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. And when it comes to the church, he organizes and holds it together like a head does a body. He was supreme in the beginning and... Leading the resurrection parade, he is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so expansive, that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. You, yourselves, are a case study of what he does. At one time, you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him, giving him trouble every chance you got. But now... By giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side and put your lives together, whole and holy in his presence. You don't walk away from a gift like that. You stay grounded and steady in that bond of trust, constantly tuned in to the message, careful not to be distracted or diverted. There is no other message. Just this one. Every creature under heaven gets the same message. I, Paul, am a messenger of this message. The mystery, in a nutshell, is just this. Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That is the substance of of our message. Hmm. Do yourself a favor and just go read it in your own times, in your own quiet times. Just make a breathtaking vision of Jesus. Perhaps the, the kind of visual equivalent of that is the statue over Rio, Christ the Redeemer. Some of you have perhaps had the privilege of, of being to Rio and seeing it for yourself, just this towering statue over the city, 120 feet tall, 700 tons. Uh, and at its peak, uh, at, the, at the mountain peak of 2,300 feet above sea level, it just towers over the city. And that, for me, is just a visual representation of Jesus, but not over a city, but over the entire cosmos. 
not over a city, but over the entire cosmos. Jesus just towers as the exalted one. He is truly Lord of all. Paul says in that text that he is the, he is the image of the invisible God. And so one of the things that we all struggle with is what does God look like? In fact, that's one of the questions every parent is probably going to get from their kid at some stage or another. What does God look like? And so here yeah, Paul says to us, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God looks like, then look at the life of Jesus. And if you're a skeptic here this morning and you're not quite sure who Jesus is, what he's about, go and spend a little bit of time just reading those first four New Testament letters, uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you haven't read them yet, go do yourself a favor. Maybe you're listening online uh, to us today, but just go and read those first Gospels. They just give you a picture of who Jesus is. And then Paul says to us, when you see Jesus, you're looking at who God is. You're looking at who God is. And so when we see Jesus touch a leper, we know that God is one who is willing to touch the untouchables and to even get his hands dirty. When we see him pause to speak to a beggar, we know that he's a God who's never too busy for anyone. When we see Jesus feed the multitudes with loaves and fishes, we know that God can supply all of our needs. When we see him with towel and basin in hand, washing feet, stinky, dirty feet, we know that no job is too menial for God. He's willing to stoop down. We see him comforting a widow, and we know that he reaches out to all those who are grieving. We see Jesus hang on a cross, and on that cross we hear him cry out those words, Father, forgive them. And we know that God forgives deeply. We see Jesus beaten and rejected and mocked and unjustly treated and alone. And we get to know that God loves us profoundly. So much love that he's willing to get himself beaten and destroyed. Willing to step into a messy broken world and into messy broken lives. Such profound love. He is a God of love. In that message translation, it says, be careful not to be distracted or diverted from the supreme Jesus. And that's what happens to all of us. Christ is over all, but stuff happens in our lives that kind of takes our eyes and our attention away. Things get our attention. It's like when you're driving down a road and you're supposed to be focusing on the road in front of you, but something happens on the side that gets your attention, hopefully not your phone, but something gets your attention and you look up suddenly like happened to me this week, I'm looking to the side, look at something at a shop and I realized the car in front of me had stopped dead and I, a, a, a millimeters away from touching. So we get distracted from Jesus. The main purpose and main goal in our lives is to see him exalted. And so I've asked Paul, Lee, just to come forward and share one of the particular ways that the church gets distracted in our modern world. One of, one of, the, one of the teachings that does the round, one of the, the falsehoods that finds its way very easy into our world and particularly into our community. And so Paul's going to come and chat to us about, uh, about that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, the, the core... Verse, the core thing that I wanted to, to, to say, I think it really is encapsulated in that song we sang earlier, Get Not I, But Through Christ in Me, when he says, um, the writer says, um, what gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. That line um, is so, like, you could, you could just think about that for, like, meditate on that for a while. There is no more for heaven now to give. And Unfortunately, um, in the modern church, we seem to have very much got lost, lost track of that. Um, I think you see it when, whenever there's an and, Jesus and this, Jesus and that, or this and Jesus, sometimes even worse. When you say uh, Jesus and health, Jesus and wealth or prosperity, Jesus and all my dreams coming true. Unfortunately, it sounds great. Like, it sounds fantastic. It sounds like, you know, Jesus and uh, every valley raised up and every mountain laid low and all my, the, my path is smoothed and my family does this and everything happens and, and we want those things. And there are many people that will tell you that you can have those things and that that's what God wants for you. Um, I just saw uh, some people that I actually know, and, and uh, they, 
they have a conference uh, a few months ago called um, uh, Partnering with the Holy Spirit to Make Your Dreams Come True. And I just think, I listen to the Jesus described in Colossians, and I don't think that's what Jesus wants. Is that, do we have dreams? Absolutely. Does God care about us individually? Absolutely. But we're talking about the Savior of the universe, and we're saying, yeah, but I want my dreams. We're saying, um, yeah, Jesus, but can I also get this? Can I also get power? Can I also get, um, can I also get deliverance? Can I also get these things? Can I also get and also and this and that? It's not about any of those things. It's about Jesus. I have so many people will cry out for more Jesus, more. And I get it. There's a part where it's always says, well, I need to know him more. I need to understand him more. I mean, more, more revelation of him in my life. But if you're not satisfied with just Jesus, the Savior of the Creator of the world who came to save the world, who died for you, and that's not enough? I'm, I'm confused. I know this, this is not the way I've always thought necessarily. I've, I, I've, I grew up in a tradition which was very much sort of God as, he's not, not doing nothing, but he's very, doing very little. He, he, he wrote the Bible, and now he's just sort of sitting and waiting, play, playing, letting things play out, you know. And so, um, so when I heard people talk about stuff that was, you know, power and God was moving and this was happening and, and he wants these things for you and, and he cares, he's put, he, he, get, he put that dream in your heart. So that means he's put his stamp on that and he wants you to have that. And I was, I was excited about that because that sounded good to me. Um, I was used to a God that was, that was very distant, you know. And so that sounded great. But over the years, I, I came to realize that that, I was, I was getting distracted from Jesus by the and, and all the stuff that came along with it. And then uh, that came to a head for me personally when, um, in 2021 when I had COVID and I had double pneumonia and um, I was in the hospital dying. And I mean dying, dying, like in the midst of it. And, uh, and I had this amazing... Um, encounter with God, and I don't, I, it's difficult to describe, um, and certainly would take a lot longer than the time I have today, but I encountered a God, the God was so big that the idea of me declaring things at him, you know, the idea of me pushing him in some way, the idea of me um, uh, attaching conditions to the things that I wanted was so ridiculous that it just, it just, all that melted away for me. It just completely melted away as I realized that, that it is truly about him. And though he destroy me, it's about him. Though I get nothing that I want, all the things that I wish I had and the things that I, that I, that, um, that I pray for sometimes, if I get none of that, he's still worthy. If I... Say to him, I, I, I must have these things. I must, you know. No, he's still worthy. I can cry out for more Jesus. There is an infinite amount of Jesus. There is not more in the sense. There's, more, there's all more, and then there's also not more because he's infinite. And I got so distracted with um, trying to sort of steer him where, you know, I wanted him to go. And the idea of steering God should make us just laugh. He's, did you, did you hear the, the, the God, that Jesus, that was described in Colossians? Can you imagine steering him, pushing him, manipulating him? It's not, it's, it can't be done. But at the same time, and I'm going to hand off to Sean, there's still good news. We are a tiny speck <laughs> in the universe, and yet there's still good news. So, Sean, explain the good news. <laughs> Thanks, man. Hey, guys. Um, so, when we were talking about this passage, uh, I mean, awesome passage, supremacy of Jesus, painting that picture, um, it was incredible, and we were thinking of his grandeur. But I started thinking of the question, okay, what does that mean for us? He's so great. Is it like when you meet someone who's just so much better at something than you, or so much richer or more successful, and you just kind of go, okay, you win. Is it like that? 
Do we sort of just look at the greatness of Jesus and sort of begrudgingly go, okay, you're awesome. Where does it leave us? And uh, <clears throat> it reminded me of the story I heard uh, from Louis Giglio. I think some guys will know Louis Giglio, Bible teacher, church leader from the States. Um, and he's a big golf fan. So uh, years ago, a movie came out about a, a famous golfer, and Louis wanted to go watch this movie. So he buys two tickets. He goes with his wife. They arrive nice and early. He's really excited to watch this movie about one of his favorite golfers. And they're sitting in the theater. Theater's almost empty, except for one guy who's sitting a few rows in front of them, just by himself there. So Louis and his, Louis and his wife are, are chatting quietly in this dark theater. And then Louis realizes that this guy in front of them, every now and again, he's like looking back at them. He's like looking back at them. He just thinks that's a little bit weird. They carry on chatting. Then this guy carries on look, looking back at them. Louis is feeling a little bit unsettled. Eventually, this guy gets up, walks out of his row, walks towards them, and comes all the way back to them. Now he's feeling like really, really uncomfortable. And the guy walks up to them and goes, have you seen the movie? So Louis and his wife are like, well, yeah, that's why we're here. We're about to watch the movie. The guy goes, I've, I've already seen the movie. I'm watching it again. Okay, cool. This guy's really excited about this movie. He starts telling them about the, the plot line, the storyline, the actors involved and everything, how cool it is. They're like, oh, great. Then the guy says, I'm in the movie. Okay, cool. A little bit weird still, but makes sense. Okay, he's an actor. He's actually in the movie. That's why he's so excited about this movie. The guy tells them uh, about the scene that he's in, and they must look out for him in the movie, and then he walks back, goes back to his seat. Theater fills up. The movie starts. Okay, so, uh, so Louis and his wife watching the movie. Also, back of their mind, waiting for this guy's scene that's going to come up in the movie, right? About halfway through the movie, they can check the guy's getting really excited, and he's like looking back at them going, Hey, guys, this is it. Scene comes on, it's, it's in, a, in the clubhouse of the golf course. The whole scene lasts about 30 seconds. There's about 100 people in this clubhouse. They can't spot this guy anywhere. And the scene ends. And they're like, oh my word, did we miss it or something? And they start to realize that he's not the star of the movie. He's not even an actor really in the movie. He's what you call an extra. You know those guys when there's a crowd in the background and everyone's blurry and you can't see any faces? He's one of those guys. And that was his part in the movie. And now they get a little bit worried because they know he's going to come up to them afterwards and ask them about it. So they try to get out and he comes back to them and he's so excited. He's asking them, what did you think of the movie? What did you think of how it went? What did you think of my scene? He says. They're like very polite. Okay, cool. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, well done and everything. And they get out of there. And barring a really awkward social encounter for Louis it actually answers a little bit of the question that I was asking in the beginning. Where do we stand in all of this? Because there's this movie happening, right? It's God's story. That's what the Bible helps us see. God's story has been going on from eternity past, through human history up to this point, and it'll carry on into eternity. That's the movie. And it's a big movie, because it's about a big God. But this movie has a star, Kids' church question, who's the star in God's story? Jesus, okay. So it has the star, and that's what our passage today is about. How incredible, I mean, the most amazing, supreme, um, brilliant star in Jesus. And who are we? We're the weird guy in the movie house who is just so excited about God's story, and he loves the star in the story, but he is so privileged that he gets to play his little role as an extra in the movie. That's us. I think we've got to find joy in that. Um, a little bit how it plays out in my life. Uh, two examples. One, uh, I, I run, and uh, last year I was running out on the Sea Point Promenade, if you run long enough, you kind of end up off the prom, but you go around where um, uh, the Twelve Apostles is. And um, it was like a, it was an overcast day. Uh, so the, the sea was like gray. It was low, dark clouds. It was like, you know, when the sea looks like moody, it, was, it looked ominous. And on the other side of these beautiful mountain ranges, and I'm running past, I'm running by there. It's cold. There's a little bit of rain and everything. I love being out in the elements. And I, it gives me a little bit of that sense of Jesus. It's really dangerous, right? You don't mess with the sea like that. At the same time, it's beautiful on the other side. And I get to enjoy that, right? I'm small. That's big. 
That's beautiful, and I get to experience this, and I find my joy in that. Oh, the very practical way is um, I have people around me, family, I've got a connect group, I've got guys around me that regularly remind me that there's this awesome story going on. It's God's story. There is already a star. I don't need to be the star, but I get to play my small role in that story. Um, and maybe you guys are thinking, as we've been speaking about practical ways, I would encourage you maybe in the week, go through that passage, read through it a few times, see how you fit into the story. Uh, maybe you want to head out, cycle, run, put a podcast or worship music in your ears. I don't know, find ways to remind yourself that it's about God's story. So that would be my prayer for us today, for me and for all of you guys. You realize that God's story is great. He already has the star. The star is the most incredible in the universe. And, but we get the joy of being a part of that story. And like the guy in the movie theater, we would take every opportunity we get to be excited and tell other people about God's story. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Our universe depends on the supremacy of Jesus, but so does your life and mine. The universe depends. If Jesus had to turn his back for a moment, the universe would just cease to exist. All that is would come to an end. So to your life and mine, in verse 19 it says this, So spacious is he, talking about Jesus, so spacious is Jesus, so roomy that everything and everyone finds their proper place in him. We only find our real purpose and our, our real joy and our real meaning when Jesus becomes the center of who we are and of our lives in very practical ways that, uh, that Sean's given to us. I don't think any distraction is, is worthy to take our eyes away from, from him. And so just to close with a, a story I came across this week of Leonardo da Vinci, that famous painting, The Last Supper, which I know that all of us are familiar with. You will perhaps notice that Jesus' hands are empty, and there's a story behind that apparently. Da Vinci took about three years to paint that painting. He wanted it to be his ultimate work of art. He, he wanted it to be defined by this particular painting. And so before he showed it to the public, he got a trusted friend just to come and have a look at it and to crit it. And the, and the friend just couldn't start, stop raving about this incredible picture. And he said, I'm particularly drawn to the cup that is in Christ's hands. I think it's beautiful, especially beautiful was the language he used. Da Vinci picked up a brush in front of his friend and started to paint out the cup. And if we go to the next picture, you'll see that there's no cup there. His friend asked him, what are you doing? I don't understand. And his response was, nothing, nothing must distract from the figure of Christ. Nothing must distract from the figure of Christ. And so having removed the cup, uh, he had to do something with the hand. And so the left hand was already outstretched, just above the table, lifted as if to bless. And also perhaps to instruct and command. Now the right hand also was now empty, but it is now outstretched, inviting, calling you and calling me. Jesus calls you and he calls me and says, make me supreme in your life and everything else will be added unto you. Make me supreme and everything else will be added unto you. Let's pray together. I think we perhaps need to have a little bit of confession time first because if you're anything like me, then I get worried and distracted by many things. My life gets busy and full and Jesus kind of quietly fades into the background of my life. He's there, but he's in the background. And so maybe some of us this morning want to start off with a time of confession. We say, Lord, you, I've got distracted and you are not supreme in my life anymore. And I ask for forgiveness for that. And I once again invite you to come and be Lord with all that that means. Lord, King, Supreme One of my life. Maybe you want to do something of that prayer first.
And then there's some of us here this morning where Jesus is not that for us yet. We kind of we we we're here because we believe that He's got something that kind of appeals. But you've never at any point in your life said, I want to crown you as king of my life. I want to relinquish the rights to my life to you, to trust you with my life. And maybe this morning is the t- first time you do that. To say, I realize this morning, Jesus, that my life only makes sense with you in charge of it. And so I relinquish the rights this morning. Hand my life over to you. And then there's some of us that are going through some really difficult things in our lives and you needed to hear this morning that Jesus is supreme. He is over your troubles and your struggles and your hardship and your illness and your difficulties and your fears and your anxieties. He towers above that. And he invites you this morning to come and snuggle in under his arms, under his wing and to find refuge in this towering supreme Jesus. And so would you prayerfully just snuggle yourself in under Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org, and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life-transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us and that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus' kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our Heavenly Father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.